second session of the second day of the Varsity Sci or Varsity Ski Symposium. I'm Yi Sing, co-president of uh, the Cambridge University Biological Society, your host for this session with a neurobiology theme. We are featuring talks from two undergraduate natural scientists at Cambridge. So I'll be introducing the speakers and moderating the Q&A session. If you're on YouTube, feel free to post your questions on the live stream chat. Um, or in, if you're on Zoom, feel free to, um, you could ask your questions in person or you can post it uh, on the chat or send it to me privately during the Q&A session. Um, our first speaker today is Milena. She will be talking about glial cells, um, which are cells that have been long thought to be just supporting neurons, but more recent research has shown that um, glial cells actually do much more than that. So she will be aiming to acknowledge their most significant contributions to what is happening in our heads. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass the floor to Milena to deliver her talk. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, hello. So yeah, like today my talk aims to provide an overview of glia and they, that they are actually much more than glue, much more than a filler in our nervous system and that they are involved um, in many activities in our brain, both in health and in disease. Actually, like centuries of biological research uh, have shown us that the answers to many like perennial questions that humanity uh, has always asked, like who we are, where our thoughts, where our feelings originate, like these answers can be found in our brain. Uh, and when we think of the cellular building, building blocks of this extraordinary organ, we usually imagine neurons like, you know, complete with all their dendrites and axons communicating with each other via electrical signals and the release of neurotransmitters. But in fact, that's just half of the picture. Because neurons constitute just about 50% of all cells in our brain. And in certain regions, like certain more evolutionarily advanced regions like cerebral cortex, their percentage is even less. So what is the other half of the brain and what does it do? So like the answer is glia. Glial cells were discovered relatively early in 1856 by an eminent pathologist, Rudolf Virchow, but they weren't considered to be of particular importance. And that's actually where their name comes from because glia means glue. Virchow and his contemporaries considered glia to be kind of a connective tissue equivalent in the nervous systems, keeping it all together. And although later it was acknowledged that glia can also take care of some of the basic biochemical needs of neurons and provide them with a suitable environment, they weren't thought to be much more than that. We had to wait until the second half of the 20th century that the time has come for glia to speak. Research has shown that glia can not only detect neural, neuronal activity, and they do so because they actually express many of the same proteins neurons do, like voltage-gated ion channels, membrane transporters, or even neurotransmitter receptors. And when glia detect neuronal activity, they respond to it with an increase in their intracellular calcium levels. What's more, glia can communicate with one another, e.g. through like, for instance, calcium waves. These calcium waves can propagate through networks of astrocytes, it's one type of glial cells, even as fast as 10 centimeters per second. And although it was initially suspected that these calcium waves propagate from one cell to another through gap junctions, so, you know, direct couplings between cells. Now we know it happens mostly through the release of so-called gliotransmitter, so glia equivalent of neurotransmitter. If, for example, one cell detects neuronal activity 
and its intracellular calcium levels increase. It releases ATP and the other glial cell receives this ATP signal and it reacts while increasing its own intracellular calcium levels. But glial cells can communicate not only with one another. One of the most shocking discoveries was that they can also communicate with neurons and influence their excitability through like their impact on synaptic transmission. Additionally, glia have a crucial role in the development of our nervous system. For instance, radial glia can act both, can provide both scaffold and trophic support for migrating cerebral cortex and cerebellar neurons during embryonic development. And glia are also crucial for axonal growth, um, directing actually their growth because they release chemical substances that act as both attractants and repellents. Accents, um, for example, um, when accents have to decide in places such as optic chiasm, whether to cross the midline of the nervous system to enter the opposite hemisphere or to remain in the same half of the brain, their decisions is mostly impacted by glia. Yeah, but before, um, in order to truly appreciate the plethora of um, functions glia can serve in our nervous system, uh, we should know that there are, their functions depend to what class of glia these particular cells belong to and that there are many variants of glia. It was um, already, um, no, it was already acknowledged uh, by a famous neuroscientist and one of the main contributors to the so-called neuron doctrine, Santiago Ramon y Cajal uh, in the 19th century. And today I'd like to discuss the functions of four major classes of glia. And these are Schwann cells, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and microglia. So let's begin with Schwann cells. They are named after their discoverer, a 19th century German biologist, Theodor Schwann. And unlike other glial cells I'm going to talk about today, they are found in the peripheral nervous system, so in um, spinal and cranial nerves. Uh, they can be found um, along peripheral axons, lying uh, along them like flattened pearls, on the string. And that's why they were in, initially, it was thought that they are just um, remnants of cells, which early in embryonic development fuse to form a major axon, or that they provide trophic support to axons, which often extend very far away from the cell body. But then it was actually discovered that they play a much more crucial role. Schwann cells wrap themselves around peripheral axons, depositing multiple layers of cell membrane, which, as you probably know, is mostly composed of fats. And in this way, they create the so-called myelin sheath. Myelin sheath is of vital importance in signal transmission because it greatly um, it acts as an insulation on the neuronal cables it can greatly accelerate the transmission of action potentials uh, even 100 fold. And it does so by uh, decreasing membrane capacitance and also enabling the so-called saltatory conductions uh, as um, signals, action potentials can jump between the so-called nodes of reindeer. Uh, another important role of um, Schwann cells is to promote axonal survival and regeneration. Um, and they do so by um, releasing neurotrophic factors, which nourish axons. And um, when an axon in the peripheral nervous system is severed, Schwann cells first um, can clean up the mess by phagocytizing um, like the remains of this axon, like cellular debris. 
And then uh, they help um, the newly sprouting axons to reach its um, target cell to restore uh, the um, original connection, guiding it all the way back. And in fact, the presence of Schwann cells is one of the reasons why um, axonal regrowth is possible in the peripheral nervous system and not in the central nervous system where they are not uh, encountered. Unfortunately, Schwann cells um, uh, also play a role in certain pathologies of the peripheral nervous system, such as um, neuropathies, uh, and they can be a um, direct target of a leprosy causing bacterium, Mycobacterium lepre, as well as the HIV virus, which indirectly um, causes them to wreak havoc uh, in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, the Schwann cells uh, equivalence in the central nervous system, so in the brain, spinal cord, but also in the optic nerve, which is ontologically a part of like diencephalon. So it's functionally considered to be part of the central nervous system. And these are oligodendrocytes. Uh, they were discovered by a student of Ramon y Cajal called Pio del Rio de Ortega. Uh, and their name comes from the fact that these are cells with a few branches as early um, histologists um, notice that they are less branched than the next class of lie I'm going to talk about, so astrocytes. Okay, so um, oligodendrocytes have four um, to six uh, highly branched uh, protrusions and they use them to myelinate um, up to 60 different axons in the central nervous system and um, one can um, ask um, a question why we don't use um, Schwann cells in the central nervous system. It's, the answer is not entirely clear, but it is suspected that it has something to do with the fact that the central nervous system is far more um, crowded than the peripheral nervous system. And it's more effective in terms of space to have one cell which can uh, myelinate several axons. And this, um, important role of myelin uh, in signal transmission in the central nervous system uh, is um, supported by the fact that when something goes wrong with it, when it is destroyed, for instance, but our own immune cells in a disease such as multiple sclerosis, um, multiple uh, sensory, motor and cognitive deficits, deficits can occur. What's also interesting is that myelin seems to uh, play a role in uh, our behavior, in like our mental states and in several neuropsychiatric disorders. What I think it's uh, really like fascinating is that in humans, myelination in the central nervous system is incomplete until we are about 25 years old. And some people, uh, some researchers link it to both like an enhanced plasticity of the young brain, as well as to the fact that adolescents tend to be more, of course, it's like a generalization, but they tend to be more impulsive uh, than adults. Uh, what is more, some research, uh, some recent evidence points out the role of oligodendrocytes and myelin in such uh, disorders like schizophrenia and major depressive disorders. Um, Brains of patients with schizophrenia, for instance, show abnormal myelin morphology as well as fewer oligodendrocytes present. And uh, it is suspected that one of the root causes of schizophrenia uh, is uh, the impaired communication between different parts of the brain, such as the ones responsible for like planning and higher cognitive functions in frontal cortex and the ones responsible for uh, emotion processing and that this um, communication is impaired because of the disruption of uh, myelin. And in uh, major depressive disorders, there are also fewer oligodendrocytes in general. And as oligodendrocytes normally contain high levels of serotonin synthesizing enzyme called dopa decarboxylase, it may be the case uh, that the deficits of serotonin 
in brains of people with depression uh, can be actually caused by something going wrong with oligodendrocytes. Okay, so let's move on to the absolute stars of glia in both like the literal and metaphoric sense, astrocytes. Astrocytes are the most versatile of all glial cells and their names uh, their name is related to the fact uh, that they have like stellate, so star-like appearance with uh, multiple branches. One of the role is to support neurons metabolically. Uh, for instance, they can take up nutrients from capillaries in the brain and then convert glucose to lactate and feed this lactate to neurons. They can also store nutrients and release them in times of need so that neurons uh, don't starve. Uh, astrocytes uh, are also responsible for providing a perfect environment for neurons to thrive. And one of the elements of this uh, provision is so-called pota potassium spatial buffering. Uh, the thing is that when neurons are active, when they fire many action potentials, uh, the concentration of potassium in the extracellular fluid around them tends to increase. And were this potassium not removed, the voltage of cross neuronal membrane could eventually drop and the neurons could not longer fire any action potentials. So what astrocytes do is they take up this excess potassium by channels in their cell membrane and they'll help to dissipate it over a larger area via gap junctions, so connections between different astrocytes in the astrocytic networks. And then they dump this potassium in the perivascular spaces in the brain, uh, where it can be from where it can be eventually re removed by the blood flow. Actually, the association uh, between astrocytes and the uh, blood flow in the brain is far more intimate because uh, via their end feed, astrocytes can not only like initiate, maintain and repair the blood brain barrier, which protects the brain uh, from harm, which could come from many different substances circulating in the blood. It's blood brain barrier also helps to um, ensure that the micro environment of the brain is truly unique. But astrocytes can also control cerebral circulation at a much smaller scale, being um, one of the, actually the principal actor in the so-called neurovascular unit. So when the neuron is more active and neighboring astrocyte can detect it and it reacts as usual with an increase in its intracellular calcium levels. And this, um, causes it, um, uh, this makes it release uh, various chemicals, for instance, for instance, prostaglandin E2. And this prostaglandin E2 causes vasodilatation, so the widening of uh, the adjacent uh, blood vessels, which can provide the uh, unusually active neuron with more oxygen and more nutrients. And actually that's, the realization which kind of blew my mind was what we see in fMRI. So when this functional magnetic resonance imaging, the brain areas can light up when we do certain tasks, the increased blood flow to these active areas of the brain can actually be the result of ast astrocytic action. There are astrocytes which mediate the whole effect. What's more, um, this um, action of astrocytes, so vasoconstriction of vasodilatation of blood vessels in the brain, if disrupted, can lead, for example, to migraine, which, um, as we know, is linked to the abnormal dilatation of um, cerebral blood vessels. But probably like the most spectacular role of astrocytes is that they can regulate synaptic transmission. Uh, first of all, Astrocytes secrete uh, proteins, which promote the very formation of synapses during development. 
Um, and this uh, protein is unique in that it's upregulated in the human brain really much as compared to primate brain. And that is believed to be one of the reasons, maybe one of the reasons why human brain um, display much more plasticity than primate brains. Also, when uh, a presynaptic neuron releases uh, neurotransmitters to the synapse uh, in order like, to propagate its message further, these are astrocytes which eventually remove the neurotransmitter from the synapse, allowing like, the next signal to be sent and also protecting neuron from the toxic effect of the accumulation of certain uh, neurotransmitters such as glutamate, because astrocytes can take up glutamate from the synaptic cleft, convert it to glutamine, and then return it to the presynaptic terminal and therefore like close um, the circle. Recent, uh, recent research has also shown that astrocytes can also release their own messages, their own like transmitters into the synaptic cleft and influence the very uh, transmission uh, of information. For instance, uh, the so-called NMDA receptors, which are believed to be crucial in the process of learning in memory in order to open and let uh, calcium ions in, they need not only glutamate, but also D-serin. And D-serin is um, released into the synaptic cl cleft by astrocytes, not neurons. So that's uh, why um, astrocytes can actually modulate what's going on in the synapse, how the information is processed in the brain. And that's, that, that's the realization which gave rise to the concept of so-called tripartite synapse. And it's the, the concept which aims to appreciate that there are more, uh, that there are, it's not, not only like presynaptic pre neuron and postsynaptic neuron in the synapse, that astrocytes also play uh, an important role in that. Unfortunately, astrocytes can also play an important role in the pathogenesis of certain neurodegenerative disorders. For example, in the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is um, the disease which Stephen Hawking suffered from in the familial form of this disease. Astrocytes um, expressing the mutated form of an enzyme called SOD1 can actually kill motor neurons, like specifically motor neurons, both in the brain and the spinal cord. And in one of the forms of Parkinson's disease, which is also used as an experimental model of this condition, caused by the ingestion, often with, in case of people with contaminated drugs, a compound called MPTP. These are astrocytes in the substantia nigra, in the basal ganglia of the brain, which convert MPTP to a, its toxic form called MPP+, which is the, something which uh, directly kills the dopaminergic neurons leading to the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. However, uh, astrocytes can also have neuroprotective functions. For instance, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, where it's believed that they can slow down the progression of this condition by binding, internalizing the deposits of um, amyloid beta. And they do so in a mechanism uh, dependent on the protein called apolipoprotein E or APOE. And when this um, protein is mutated, it's a major risk factor for the development of Alzheimer's disease. As we have seen, astrocytes can play an ambiguous role in uh, many uh, diseases of like the nervous system in many neurological disorders. And actually it's the same case with the last class of glial cells I'm going to discuss with microglia. Uh, microglia are unique in that regard that they actually do not originate in the nervous system. Uh, they are derived from uh, myeloid progenitor cells uh, it's, um, they have the same um, pedigree as macrophages, and then they invite 
the brain in the early stages and development. The main role of microglia uh, is to act as um, immune defense in the central nervous system as because uh, of the blood brain barrier, normal immune cells uh, like lymphocytes or macrophages and other white blood cells cannot uh, enter the brain. So like in a healthy brain, microglia mm, exist as um, solitary cells with multiple branches, which constantly move around and explore their surroundings, searching for potential dangers. And when such danger is detected, microglia undergo um, uh, an amazing transformation. They become highly mobile amoeboid cells. They proliferate extensively, so they divide. Their numbers can increase uh, dramatically. And they um, can, in that state, they can recognize, uh, destroy, and phagocytose invaders. But they also release uh, substances such as reactive oxygen species or cytokines, which can be uh, toxic uh, for neurons. And neurons can suffer collateral damage uh, if microglia initiate an inflammatory response in the brain. Uh, for instance, uh, tumor and necrosis factor alpha, one of the cytokines um, secreted by microglia, can uh, promote demyelination, which leads to neurodegeneration. And actually, this collateral damage suffered by neurons as a result of microglial action is a feature of many diseases of the nervous system. And recent um, research shows it may be one of the mechanisms in which neurodegeneration occurs in prion diseases. However, um, microglia can also promote repair in the nervous system following injury or inflammation. First of all, they can clean up cellular debris. Uh, they also deliver neuroprotective factors to injured neurons, and they recruit neurons and astrocytes to the damaged site, helping to regenerate the healthy neural tissue there. Uh, they also, uh, another function of microglia uh, is to help, uh, yeah, they, actually microglia are not only um, associated with like neuronal injury, uh, they can also help to form a proper neural circuits early in development because they can remove inappropriate synaptic connections while uh, tagging them with complement proteins and then phago, um, like engulfing, phagocytosizing uh, them. And this help like our brain to wire correctly early in life. Unfortunately, even this process, if something goes wrong, can be really detrimental. It is believed that this um, synaptic destruction by microglia may be involved in the pathogenesis, for instance, of glaucoma and Alzheimer disease. Um, unfortunately, also like microglia, despite being um, immune cells, despite being uh, defenders of our central nervous system uh, can also cause uh, much damage if they themselves become a target of invaders. Now we know that HIV virus can also infect microglia, can replicate inside microglial cells because they microglia ex express the same receptor as T cells, so CD4. And when microglia become infected, it's um, a really unfortunate occurrence because they not only move through the brain because they are mobile, they can um, dissipate uh, HIV virus particles throughout our whole nervous system, but they also kind of go, go mad because they sense that something is wrong and they signal to astrocytes to release more glutamate. And as I have already mentioned, 
excessive levels of glutamate in the nervous system can lead to the death of neurons uh, via the excitotoxic uh, pathway. And that, that's why um, AIDS can also result in neurological deficits because neurons die uh, as a release of like friendly fire from our own um, immune um, defense in the brain. Okay, so I hope that I have managed not to bore you to death uh, and also to um, convince you that there is uh, much more to glial cells that their name suggests uh, and that they are certainly more uh, than a mere glue. And even if we dare to call them servants of neurons, we should acknowledge that they can not only like eavesdrop on their neuronal masters detecting their activity, but they can actually influence their decision and that they secretly run the whole house from behind the scenes. As you know, uh, neurons are kind of aristocratic cells and they would not survive for even a short while outside of the comfort zone uh, provided by the actions of Glyak. And we've seen that um, if these glial cells, if, are, if these necessary backstage workers rebel, ally with the invaders, even inadvertently, or just start uh, neglecting their duties, neurons are usually doomed. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Milena, for your um, uh, informative uh, overview of the roles of glial cells in the nervous system. Um, so I am going to read out a question from YouTube. Okay. So one from Anna. Um, Thank you for this great speech. You mentioned that Schwann cells are one of the reasons why axons can regrow in the peripheral nervous system, but not the central nervous system. What are the other reasons? Okay, so actually there are many reasons, but it turns out that they are all, or almost all like related to glia. The thing is it's nothing particular about axons in the peripheral nervous system, because like some experiments, for instance, of rats show that if we bridge the injured, spinal cord with a fragment of the peripheral nerve, like central nervous system axons can actually regrow through it and form functional connections. So it's like about the central nervous system environment, which kind of hampers axonal regrowth. And like one thing is that when there is an injury in the central nervous system, astrocytes tend to form a so-called glial scar. And it is both like a physical barrier for axonal regrowth. And also it's coated with certain proteins which like cause the collapse of axonal growth cone. And like the other thing is that, another thing that can cause like the collapse of axonal growth cone are proteins found in myelin such as no-go or MAG. And that's why axonal regrowth is virtually impossible in the central nervous system because like axons while regrowing while trying to restore the original connections they would have to follow like white matter pathways and there's a lot of myelin there and as myelin like proteins in myelin causes like growth kind of axons to collapse that's kind of impossible thank you and another question from YouTube. Are there any theories why the percentage of, new, of neurons is lower in some of the more developed parts of the brain? Uh, yeah, like the thing I've read is that for instance, the evolutionarily older parts of the brain, such as cerebellum, tend to have more like larger neuron to glia ratio that are the newer in terms of evolution parts of the brain, such as cerebral cortex. It does, it's actually kind of the thing that 
there's some controversy about that, but the more, let's say, advanced an animal is, like when we start with protovertebrates and then go through fish, reptiles, and mammals. Uh, so the, the more glia it tends to have relative to neurons. So maybe like, for instance, like the neurons have more like advanced work to do. And also the transmission of information has to be quicker. So we need both more oligodendrocytes like to myelinate all these axons and more like astrocytes to support neurons in all the tasks they do. Thank you. Um, so if there are any questions, um, feel free to send it to me or post it in the chat. Um, I'm pretty sure Milena will be able to answer the questions even yeah, after so. the second talk. So 